We send salams to our blessed Imam. Assalamu alaikum ya Aba Abdullah wa ala al-arwah allati hallat bi fina'ik alaikum minni salamullah abadan ma baqit wa baqiya al-layl wa al-nahar wa la ja'alu Allah akhir al-ahd minni li ziyaratikum Assalamu ala al-Husayn wa ala Ali ibn al-Husayn wa ala awlad al-Husayn wa ala ashab al-Husayn Assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh I begin in Allah's name, the Beneficent, the Merciful, and tonight being the ninth, actually the technically the ninth night of Muharram, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to remember the enormous tragedy that took place in Karbala. It was an epic form of tragedy, a tragedy that should reside in our hearts at all times because it is the source of understanding as to why this life is the way it is. Karbala exemplifies every characteristic that you and I need to understand in order to pass this examination because Imam Hussain went to Karbala to reflect the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the opportunity of the gravity of the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the Messenger did not come except at a later time which was on the battlefield of Karbala. We know the story of Ibrahim when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested Ibrahim. Ibrahim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested him with a very difficult trial and the, the most difficult one was for him to sacrifice his firstborn Ismail. There's one thing when an enemy hits you and kills you, that's a great sacrifice. But when Allah puts un us under a trial, a very difficult trial, whereby the challenge here is more to do with Iman and real faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we find it to be extremely difficult. What Ibrahim salam was tested with was an enormous task. And after he achieved that trial, Allah said, Inni ja'iluka linnasi imama. We have made you an imam, meaning you have a special quality. Now remember, imam here is not the imam what they were talking about, the 12 imams. Imama has many meanings. There is imama in prophethood, and then there is imama after prophethood. Really what is after prophethood, which is the most important, is not imama, it's wilaya. Wilaya is really the essence that we are talking about. Wilaya. Wilaya has many meanings. One is mastership, wali. The other is love, enormous love and attraction. Innama waliyukumullah wal rasul walladina amanu. Here wali is used in the singular. It means the authority of Allah is parallel to the authority of the Holy Prophet, which is parallel to the authority of those who give charity in the state of Ruku, who are the Ulil Amri Minkum. So Imam Hussein Alayhi in Karbala was a reflection of the Prophet, who was the reflection of the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's very, it's very pristine. The structure that Allah has left us with to guide us is very pristine, and it needs to be. Because as believers, we need guidance and we need a structure, not a haphazard system of us choosing people randomly in a system and saying, well, this person is representing me towards God. No. There is a criterion, an essential criterion for us to follow. And when we understand that criterion, we begin to understand the structure. And once we put this structure into vision, the content starts flowing into us properly. And then hopefully we absorb it and we become it. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to remember that this dhikr of Imam Hussain alayhi salam is not unusual. If anyone says, why do you do dhikr of Imam Hussain alayhi salam? Tell them the whole Quran is a dhikr and the Quran is filled with stories of prophets and representatives of God and people who were not even chosen as prophets like Ashab al-Kaf. They were youth, fitya. They were youth, they were young, young people. How come they are so mentioned as an example for us to understand and to follow? What about our Imams? What about our Prophets? Should they not be the best role models to follow? Ultimately, we have to choose who is the best. We have to choose the best ones in society are the most moral people. And when we talk about infallibility, where Prophets and Imams do not perform sins or mistakes, it's precisely for this reason, to keep our pathway, the flow of information, the correct flow of information from Allah to the heart, it has to be a clean flow. It cannot have dirt in the way. It cannot be confused in the way. Otherwise, I'll get dirty information. 
my information will be confused. And Allah does not do that. Allah even says to the Prophet, Say, the knowledge of time is with me. Say to the people, Say, the Prophet is being told to tell the people that I am a clear warner. Nadirun mubin, clear. No ambiguity, no confusion. Even Allah is so specific in the Quran. He says, Allah has not sent any prophet except with the language of the people. So when we live in these societies, for example, and our children speak a specific language, we have to cater to those languages. I travel the world and I find some communities who came from the East. They're insisting that their Eastern language be the only language of communication for their children. I said, that's not a problem. If you're successful in having your children understand that language at home and in society, then feed them that language. But what if the children don't understand that language? Let's say you're living in, in Sweden and the only language that they're talking is their language of the local community. And you came, let's say, from Pakistan or you came from India, you came from Lebanon or you came from Iraq. You cannot enforce your children to only listen to that language. Having that language is important. Our children should be multilingual. They should speak the language of their, their, their forefathers. I think it's extremely important to teach our children to be multilingual. Extremely important. It gives them access to so many diverse perspectives in life. It's fantastic. But at the end of the day, that's one piece of the equation. But we must not deny our children the knowledge that they need based on their language. So Allah says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا بِلِسَانِ قَوْمِ We have not sent any messenger except by the language of its people. Why? لِيُبَيِّنَ لَهُمْ So that they are very clear in explaining to them the message. So that flow, as you notice, is very pristine in the Quran, subhanAllah. It continues to flow, that the clarity is extremely essential, but fundamentally, brothers and sisters, I want us all to understand that the structure that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with in terms of his prophets and the imams is so magnificent, it is second to none. And then once we examine this superstructure, we understand even the quality of this structure is that these representatives were supreme in their characters, that their moral were impeccable second to none and the bottom bottom line discussion about anything when it comes to Allah and religion it must boil down to good moral behaviors otherwise there is no need to discuss God for atheists spend most of their lives rejecting God they don't talk about God they still continue to receive the benefits of this universe the Sun still gives them the energy just like it gives to you and me, right? You might say, well, an atheist doesn't remember God. Do you remember God? You've complicated your life. Look, things are working just fine. What do I need a God for? What do I need a religion for? Bottom line where the atheist does not talk to us, they're afraid, is on the issue of morality, the issue of halal and haram, the issue of do's and don'ts. They don't want to talk about that. That's where massive confusion starts. They hide that because, and if you bring it up, they'll say, we will decide. I said, who's we? You? Me? What authority do we have to know what is right and what is wrong? No human being can understand the quality of morality, and especially at a social level, it's impossible. We will become guinea pigs, we will be used as experimental beings, and then our generations will be destroyed only to find out later that we have to retract this law. When too much damage has been done, this is not how morality is adjudicated in life. No. It has to come higher than the human being. We understand it has to be given upon mankind. And the moral principle must be universal. It must be applicable for all of mankind. And all of mankind must benefit from it. It's not, it should not be exclusive to the quote-unquote believers. Meaning God did not send this religion just for us and the rest of them are just going to get lost. This is a false religion if it, if it portrays that. If God says, I've chosen you as my people and everybody else is just a product of uh, what we call byproduct of society, you see, and you have no, not, no importance, God has chosen us by blood, you know this is a false religion. This cannot be the true religion because the religion of Allah has to be universal. All skin colors, all nationalities, all human beings, in fact, all creations 
should come under the law of morality, not only human beings, even at the ecosystem, even the animals, the trees, the birds, everything has to come under the jurisdiction of the moral principle. Otherwise, for sure, it's a wrong religion. So when we are searching religion out there, first question we must ask, how universal is this religion that you're saying? You'll find no religion is universal at the most, incre at the, at the, uh, in the most incredible levels, universally, you place it in comparison to all religions, you will not find anything that comes even near Islam. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Muhammad. It's extremely important to understand that. Now let me recite this verse. Yesterday I touched on the issue of fantasy, music. I want us to go further because Islam is a religion of morality. Imam Hussein alayhi main foundation of morality is do not allow tyranny. Do not allow injustice. Shukran. Do not allow evil doing. Do not allow indecency. Do not allow lying. Our Imams have said one of the worst crimes a human being performs is when they lie. Lying is horrible to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah hates it. Allah even tells us, خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ بالحق. God created the universe in truth. Be a truthful person. Then you will merge with the reality. But when you lie, you cause all kinds of destructions in society. Muawiyah, the reason we don't like him, was because he was a consistent liar. He loved to lie. That was the thing about him. His son also, they manufactured stories. They twisted things. Muawiyah lied about Ahl al-Bayt. He made them so bad. Listen to this story, brothers and sisters. You know in Karbala, when Imam Hussain salam asks for a moment to pray, and we'll talk about prayers, Ibn Sa'd is advised by one of the soldiers that if the people see the grandson of the Prophet praying, they will know that their, their Khalifa lied to them because he told them they don't pray. And if they see them praying on the battlefield, their hearts will change. So stop them from praying. Imagine how evil these people were. That's how much lies they had. And you cannot eradicate this lie at the level that we are talking about unless you give your blood for the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why Imam Hussein went forward to Karbala to prove. I mentioned the other day about Adam Walsh and John Walsh. When his son was killed, he became, it became a part of him to keep his son alive. He said, I'm going to go out and catch criminals. But can we compare that with the message of Imam Hussein alayhi salam? He's a representative of Allah. A young child when he dies, it's a very important thing to keep him alive. And we should keep such people's uh, lives alive. When, they are, when a child is, is killed, when he's abused, we should all rise to fight against those who go against our children. We should make it an issue to prevent our children from ever being abused at all levels. Sexual level, material level, spiritual level, psychological level, and physical level. We have to prevent it. When our women are being abused, for example, we should make it an issue for all of us. Let's not wait for somebody in our family to be abused and then for us to make an issue. We should be cognizant for the Messenger of Allah said, no believer sleeps in the night without worrying the affairs of his neighbor. That if his neighbor is not feeling well, he should not sleep well. For that's the sign of a believer. They should be worried about that. So we have all kinds of social problems in our communities today. We should be concerned about them and we should take a positive step towards making it uh, possible. But I say if I was to ask you that if we're going to establish the greatest movement, America's most wanted is a very good movement, but what is even greater thousand times that will even prevent people like criminals who are committing their crimes to come in the right path? Nothing but the message of Imam Hussain alayhi in Karbala, which brings alive the message of the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You and I are submiss submissive Muslims. Nothing should be more important to us than the affairs of our Prophet and his Imams. Nothing should be more important. Even our parents, our children, our families should be looked through the lens of these people. They are axiomatic, as I call it. Our Imams, our Prophets and our Imams are axiomatic individuals that Allah has placed at the center of our lives. They are the nucleus of our movement. And we should see only through them in the 360 degree view. At the center is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And these representatives are at that center representing Allah and we must see the world through that way. That means when we get married, we have children, we raise our children, whatever it is, it should be through the eyes of that center. So the biggest, the most important issue we have to take to heart is to say that yes, when something hits home, I should make it my livelihood to keep them alive. Nothing hits us more at home than Imam Hussein salam, and of course the Holy Prophet. Because remember, as I mentioned, the shahada of Imam Hussein in Karbala is the shahada of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in uh, Surah Al-An'am, the sixth chapter is the verse that I started with. I want to touch on it very briefly. My time, I don't have too much time as you know, delivering two lectures back to back is very taxing. And time-wise, you're always constrained and you have to be careful what you're saying so that you keep the flow of the message. So bear with me, please, if I'm jumping a little bit, but the essence is the same. The story is we must be moral individuals. Yesterday, I spoke about music. Music is an instrument that takes us towards immorality. Let me touch that subject very briefly and quickly to, to complete the subject before I go on to this verse. These levels of fantasy that Allah has enabled us to achieve, we should fantasize. Fantasies are good, but fantasize in the scope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we talk about music, for example, there is good music. People say, you know, all music is haram. Now, if you study our maraji and their positions, there are some of our maraji who are very strict and they say, all music is haram. They take this, what we call ihtiyat position, precautionary position, and they negate all of it. And that's perfectly fine. I respect that. Then there are those who say no. There are certain kinds that should be allowed because they are, music is a very powerful instrument that can induce a positive behavior just like it can induce a negative behavior. So the question is not the instrument, it's the intention and what does it do? And yes, the danger of music is it's individualistic, how an individual sees the instrument and they can take it just like a knife which is a very positive tool, but it can also be used very negatively. And therefore, our maraja, when they take a very uh, precautionary position, it is perfectly fine. We have to understand that. When I was studying this area, I used to say, why isn't there just one clear rule, you know, that just says, why is the Quran sort of giving me the general rule, but it's not direct? And the scholars would say to me that that's the trial upon you. It comes to you for your understanding that when you struggle with your self-struggle, this Jihad al-Akbar, it is healthy for you. You will decide because your ultimate goal should be to submit to Allah. So anything that comes in front of you, not only music, a beautiful face, money, power, a house, a car, anything, if it distracts you away from Allah, watch out because that could be your destruction. So the reason I'm speaking about music is because it has a tendency to take us in an immoral fashion. Today, if you look at the immoral places like nightclubs and casinos and those kinds of places where Allah has forbidden for us to visit, those instruments are prevalent there because that's how they work. They dim the lights and they make you fantasize negatively so that you commit the Haram Act. And the Haram Act in terms of indecency is so quick it's a matter of a few seconds it can trap you. All you need to see is somebody who passes in front of you that fits your fantasy, and if the opportunity opens up, it's very hard to, turn the, to, to put on the brakes. Very difficult. That's how human nature works. Because the minute you're in the zone, you go. And then once you're done with it, you realize, oh my God, what have I done? And the interesting thing about time is once you've done it, to correct it now cannot be backward. It's only forward. That means you're going to live with it forever. So precaution, being cautious is better than finding a cure. That's why Islam is the way it is. That's why Imam Hussein was warning us that I'm coming forward to protect what my grandfather established in this Al-Islam because it is to promote good and forbid evil. So what does the Quran tell us? Allah says the following. He says, come, say, come. I will recite what your Lord has forbidden you. Remember that you do not associate anything with him and show kindness to your parents. Notice in the Quran four or five times, whenever Allah mentions shirk, 
not associating someone with Allah, the next verse is kindness to parents. It's amazing, the Messenger of Allah say, if there could be anyone Allah would have allowed to be worshipped other than Him, it would have been the parents. That's how important our parents are. And the Qur'an is associating oneness of Allah with parenthood, kindness to parents. It's a very fascinating essence. It's a whole discussion in itself. There's no time to discuss that. But a, a brief introduction that Tawheed, which is the heart of morality, that when I focus myself towards Allah and I love Allah and I understand what my deen is about, and I believe I'm going back to him and I believe he's watching me and I believe he has placed me on this earth for a short period of time to be tested and I believe he creates everything beautiful and I do believe that when I die even more beautiful things will be waiting for me then I am willing to sacrifice those pleasures of the world today for a greater future that's Iman Allah is saying all your Islam is pegged in Tawheed but it's going to come to fruition when your parents become representatives. Because at the heart of every child is their parents. I deal with kids all the time. And I tell you, when I work with them, at the end of the day, it's the battle between me and the parents. If the parents are good, my battle is easy. In fact, they help me so much. But if the parents are not good, I tell you, if I take even the best child and the child understands the deen of Allah and wants to completely submit to Allah, if the parents come in the way, it's very, very difficult to bring them close. Very difficult. Because the child has this birthright to their parents. And the parent has a right upon them. And the parent can threaten them. And the parents can say, I will not bring happiness to you if you don't obey me. And if that obedience is against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's a battle. So how Allah is telling me, He says, when you worship Allah, also respect your parents. It's so powerful that parents lay the foundation of goodness in our societies. Today we have a lot of problems in society, not because children are naturally bad. I believe they were not raised properly. When I see a child who's good, I give credit to the parents. Believe me, whenever I see a beautiful child, my first question is, where, is, where are his parents? Where are her parents? <clears throat> and you see them. You see them full of akhlaq. You understand that. You say, wow, excellent upbringing. If there's one thing I honor the most in my life, is when I see a beautiful child. I just look at the parents. I want to hug them. I want to respect them. I want to remember them all the time. And this is not within Islam. Even among Christians, even among non-Muslims, when I see them, when a child respects his parents, I admire them. I admire them. I said, I admire you. I said, you are so respectful to your mother and father. I admire you. That is proof to me that that's the heart of morality to me. More important than a person who speaks loud about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or pre prays in front of everybody in public and even has a beautiful voice of reciting Quran. But if we are harsh to our parents, believe me, all the other actions are nullified. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. It's a whole discussion in itself. I don't have time. My time is going to run out once I get into any of these discussions. But I want us all, and this is a very sensitive subject. Mothers come to me all the time and say, Brother, please talk to my son. He is not respecting me. My son doesn't respect me. He's harsh to me. He uses foul language to me. He's not, he, his friends are more important. I went through that stage too when I was a teenager. I gave more priority to my friends than my parents. When I was growing up as a teenager, if there is one thing that disturbed me the most later on in life, especially in my university years, if there was one thing that pinched me the most, that hurt me the most, that made me realize my foolishness and being a victim of society, it was my importance that I gave to anyone other than my parents. And I cried, I cried for many years. And I made a vow that if I was ever to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it must be around my parents. Otherwise, I have no value in the eyes of Allah. For that's the one that fed me, that took care of me. If I, if I cannot be grateful to them, how can I be grateful to Allah? If I can't even be grateful to the very hand that, took, that fed me, that continues to feed me, how can I be grateful to Allah? It's not possible. I said all my prayers cannot be accepted. 
Because if I haven't given ode to the very people that Allah has gifted me with, and I have not respected them, how can I ever respect Allah and His Messenger and His Alal Bayt? It's a contradiction. My friends were so important to me because I thought about it. I said, why are they so important? What makes our friends so important to us? You know what it is at the core level? We put our priorities in the wrong order because there is this false notion that that which you cannot have is more precious than that which you already have. That's the problem. Now we know we can't get rid of our parents. And we know no matter how harsh we are to them, they will always accept us. That even if we do wrong things, they will forgive us. And you can't change your parents. You can have more brothers, more sisters, more husbands, more wives. You can have all kinds of friends, money. Everything is replaceable. But parents are just not replaceable. So we abuse them. That's why you know the sibling rivalry when brothers and sisters fight and brothers and brothers punch each other and fight. They don't care. They're harsh with each other. They use foul language with each other. They kick each other. It's because they have not taken account of the mercy of Allah. And I realized that later on in my life, I said, my God, the greatest gift Allah gave me is my family. And he is so merciful that he locked them in my life that I can never lose them as a gift of Allah. So Allah says, go and value that. Your friends will come and they will go. And they should only be important for Allah. Otherwise, if it's for money and for power and for business, it's a transaction only. And it can fade and walk away from you. There's no permanency in it. That's why our Imams and Prophets are so important to me because I, can't, I can never lose them. And I know they will never backbite me. They will never cheat me. And when I assess my parents, it was the same. I said, no one will protect my interests but my parents. That's how important it is. We don't value it. The other devaluation, I'm moving fast. The whole subject on parents is very deep. Inshallah, I'll continue it in my, in my subsequent presentation. It's spouses. When we get married, there's a psychology here. It's very deadly. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Ibrahim says uh, that we have enjoined upon you. لَإِن شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ وَلَإِن كَفَرْتُمْ إِنَّ عَذَابِ لَشَدِيدٌ When you are grateful, I'll give you more. But if you're ungrateful, I will punish you with a severe punishment. You find when people get married, when as long as they're dating, and dating here in an indecent way especially, but I'm talking about even a person who does it in a decent way, where there, there's company, where there's haya, there's control, where no one can point a finger that you did any indecent thing. There's an approach, by the way, even approach how to get married. Today, electronic systems are so easily available, people chat with each other. There's a sister talking to a guy, he says, yes, I like you, how about we meet, come on, let's go. And then he asks the brother, what are you doing with this? Well, we're looking to get married, inshallah. So he looks halal. I said, you've stepped the boundaries. Says, what do you mean? I said, if that sister has the guts to talk to you freely like this, you think she's going to stop talking after you marry her? And you are so bold to talk to a sister online that you've never met, you think you're going to stop talking after your marriage? What kind of character is this? You see the problem? This is the problem. In our community today, the freedom of expression between genders is so open. And we think this is freedom. This is not freedom. This is poison in the society. Poison. We have, we, we have to try to understand the character of Ahlul Bayt. They were not extremists. When their women, when they used to come out of the house, people used to announce on the street that Ahlul Bayt are coming out of the house and people used to prepare themselves because they were so sanctified. They were so high in moral status. They didn't just do that to impress us. They did that so, uh, so we should follow that. Why? We said, no, this is an expression of freedom. What we don't understand is human interaction is a matter of a few seconds. And then it's destruction thereafter. It's a snowball. We don't understand that. We think it's okay, it's fine, we're hugging, having a good time, you know, pushing each other, playing with each other. It's okay, she's like my sister. Look at the illegitimate children being born in our societies today. It's astronomical. Never in the history of the human race have more illegitimate children been born in society than today. 
Why? It's that freedom of expression that is so free. Now you might say, what's wrong with that? Ask the husband whose wife is cheating him. Ask the wife whose husband is cheating. Ask them, how do you feel? You want even the worst one is when the child is known. When the child knows that their father is cheating on their mother or their mother is cheating on their father or both of them, God forbid. You know what it does to the child? They abandon morality. They say, if the foundation of my morality is so shattered, then I'm going to be worse than them. This is how crime increases. There's a direct correlation to crime to illegitimate children. Why? Because when parents conceive their children not in a responsible manner, children lose their focus of morality, which leads them to criminal activities. We have to be extremely careful the divorce rates today are astronomical. Why? Because we don't pay attention to the na'mah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We take it as a joke. When we are raised as children, you love someone today, give them a red heart. February 14th, Valentine's Day, shower them with roses, give them plastic roses, make them feel good, while you've got a lineup of another series of roses being delivered elsewhere. Who cares? It's a replaceable society. Just keep moving along, you know, like, a, like you're doing window shopping. And we're destroying lives. People are not objects, brothers and sisters. We're emotional people. We bond. We have relationships. We hold it to heart. One slip of a relationship can hurt a person's psyche. What about the child whose entire morality is dependent on looking at the two foundations that they're standing on, which is their mother and their father? What about them? When we shatter those, what do we do to our children? Today, the reason all these scenarios are happening because we don't pay attention to the fundamental principles of life. We've become, we are so material in our system. Don't think, just be, just be emotional. You feel good, you go and fulfill what you want. You like something, go after it. Don't think about it. Think about it tomorrow. So when people date, you find they're so nice. They look so lovely. They're so gentle. Oh, they give you the sweetest talk. Why? Because they want you. And they know you can say no. So they're careful. And then when you say yes, they're still nice to you. Then when the nikah is recited, when the marriage is recited, <clears throat> now shaitan plays havoc. She says, she's yours. <laughs> she's stuck now. She can't do anything. So abuse her. So the guy says, I'll be back. Leaves the wife at home, cook, goes out with his friends, plays Halo all night. <laughs> Two days, three days, doesn't show up. What happened? I was busy doing very important things. I have heard scenarios of husbands getting married, playing Halo 24 hours a day, to the point where they got divorced. Not only this, even their homes were foreclosed because they were so busy playing this silly game. Because they just didn't pay attention. Why? Who cares? I've got my wife. See, that woman in my house, she's my slave. I've heard stories of husbands beating their wives, breaking their fingers, breaking their faces. I said, how can a human being do that to an amana, a gift that Allah has given you? A father and a mother who's given their daughter to you is a huge, huge step to give. How does a man abuse? And I speak about men abusing because the real case in society today is men abusing their women more than women abusing their men. Women do abuse, but they abuse them differently. And let's be fair, but I'm concerned why this behavior exists. We don't pay attention because mentally we say, she's mine. I can't get rid of her. And if I do, the society will stigmatize me. So I'll keep her and look good like a couple when we have nice programs. I'll walk with her and look like a nice husband and a father. And then when I'm busy outside, I'll have my pleasure, which I was always having before I married her. Notice how we belittle the system. And the same for our sisters. Same. When they're married, their responsibility, rather than thinking that Allah has given me this na'mah, it's mine now, it's guaranteed to be mine. But the condition is, I must honor it. We don't. We belittle it. And when we belittle it, what happens? We start taking advantage. How about fathers who hit their children and mothers who beat their children? Corporal punishment. 
I am totally against this idea. Children are too intelligent, too beautiful to be touched in a physical fashion. They should be reasoned with. They should be spoken to. They should be given as a good role model as parents. Our children will flower, I'm telling you. We will have them standing on these podiums and they will be speaking magnificent statements and we'll say, how did you come? I said, the work of the parents. Look what they grew and look at the benefits we're getting in the Ummah. Please, brothers and sisters, I'm just leaving us this message. If I remember Ahl al-Bayt, I don't see any such characteristics. Look what Allah says in the Quran and I conclude. He said, do not associate anything with him and show kindness to your parents. Value it. Do not slay your children for fear of poverty. Value it. Children, they were fathers who used to take their daughters where the daughters would grab their fingers thinking, thinking Baba is going to take me to play outside and Baba is digging in the sand and the daughter is helping to dig this grave. And then the father throws the girl into this hole and she's holding on to Baba. She says, Baba, and he's covering it because he says, sorry, you're a female. I can't accept you. On the day of judgment, they will say, for what sin did we commit that we were killed? We don't value. We don't value. I'm telling we, our community, our brotherhood here in this ummah, these centers, these programs we have, we must value them. And Islam is not difficult, brothers and sisters. People say Islam is difficult. It's not difficult. The very people who tell me that it's difficult when the football game is taking place in Detroit, it's freezing weather, they have to stand since morning to evening to get a ticket, they stand out there. They miss even the Ashura to go out there and play and, and watch a football game because that's not difficult. But when you ask them to pray and when you ask them to remember Allah, they say, is religion is difficult? No. It's not difficult. Allah even mentions the Quran. We did not send this religion to make it difficult for you. We sent it to make it easy for you. So let's remember this value. Allah says, do not kill your children. We provide for you and for them. And do not draw. Do not la taqrabu. Don't approach indecency. This is my discussion today. Those of them which are apparent and those which are not apparent. Sometimes there's a subtlety of indecency. Allah says, even that, don't approach it and do not kill the soul which Allah has forbidden except for the requirement of justice. Look at the universal principle. If you take such, just this one verse, ask the whole world, does this apply to you? Not a single sane human being will deny its applicability. That's why Islam is so powerful. That's why Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world. That is why it is the biggest threat in the world because its forces are towards morality. That's why we're being attacked today. We're being attacked by all levels for this reason and nothing else. And you and I should be proud to rise and say, if that is what we're being attacked for, then let us rise and be the most moral people to make a case to the rest of the world to say, we are going to obey this the way Allah has commanded it so that we are happy and hopefully you will be happy. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. I'm concluding my brothers and sisters. Tonight, as you know, is the ninth night and you find that the tragic moment of Karbala as it's getting nearer and nearer to that moment, we must not forget that our spirits should be somber. We should be sad. Some people say, what's the big deal in Ashura? You know, why is people are sad and they don't want to talk too much? I said, reflect. Imagine your very beloved one was butchered on the battlefield. How would you feel? Imagine our father was killed like that. You think you and I would ever let go? You think you and I would allow people to make fun and jokes on that day? No. Imam Hussein alayhi salam is superior to all of us. Supreme. Let's put that into effect. Our characteristics in these nights should be somber. That even if a non-Muslim asks you, why do you look so sad? It's an opportunity to tell them that the grandson of the Prophet was massacred 14 centuries ago. I am sad. Make it a conversation. Imam Hussain alayhi salam, as he's approaching Karbala on his way, in the middle of the, uh, uh, on his way, he goes into a swoon and he says, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un. His blessed son Ali Akbar was riding with him on the horse. He says, Baba, why did you say that? He said, my grandfather, my, my grandfather has just told me, the Holy Prophet just told me that we are approaching our massacre, our death. Ali Akbar was 18 years of age. He was born in Shaban. 
44 AH. He was 18 years old only while he's approaching Karbala. Historians say that his face resembled a car. He was a carbon copy of the Prophet. Imam Hussain salam says, anytime I want to remember the Messenger of Allah, anytime I want to remember my grandfather, I would look at Ali Akbar because he looked just like the Holy Prophet. His voice was magnificent. He had a beautiful voice. And he was only 18, brothers and sisters, 18, a teenager. He was so handsome, so full of dignity. All of us should look at him as our role models, brothers. Not some of these other guys out there. They can be good on the basketball courts. They can be good in their sports field. But keep them there. Don't bring them into your heart when it comes to Iman. Keep them there. They are good there, not here. Here, the heart is sacred. It's special. Don't allow anyone to occupy it except these kinds of people. Ali Akbar says to his father, he says, we are going to Haq, aren't we? Are we not on Haq? Are we not on, tr on the truth? The father said, yes, we are. That's why we're going. He said, then let us proceed. Let us meet this death where it is waiting for us. The man, Imam Hussain alayhi salam, is so impressed with his son. He says, what kind of a son Allah has blessed me with? Father, who is so honored to have a son like him. Then on the day of the battle, among the Banu Hashim, as you know, the companions went first. They were all massacred. Then the Banu Hashim went next. Among the Banu Hashim, the first person to go on the battlefield was Ali Akbar. The first one to become Shaheed was Ali Akbar. It was a proof that Imam Hussein, even in his family, would not let anyone die before his own self. And Ali Akbar was his own self. They say at Fajr time, Ali Akbar recited Adhan. At the time of Fajr Salah, Ali Akbar stood up and recited Adhan. And as the Adhan is being recited, Imam Hussein is crying. He said, my remembrance of my grandfather is through this son that Allah has blessed me with. That was the love of the father to the son. And the son to the father, the honor, the respect, it's impeccable. We must resonate with these people. We must. I can't stress enough. Even my life, I can say I protected my, my deen by remembering these people. For it became my guideline towards which to avoid all this haram in the world. Imam Hussein, at the end, when the battle has started and all the companions have become shaheed, you find that Ali Akbar seeks permission from his father, give me permission to go forward. They say that Imam Hussein says, I can't stop you, Ali. Go. He puts his son on the horse, bids him goodbye. But before he does that, he goes to his mother Layla. He goes to his sisters, he goes to his aunts, and he says salam to all of them. And then he ascends the horse. And as the Imam is ready to push him, he follows him. Ali looks behind. He says, Baba, we said salam. He said, if you became a father, you know how I would feel. I can't let go of my son, but ridam bi qada wa taslim and li amri. We are pleased with the qada that Allah has laid for us. And with this which is happening, we are pleased. Ali Akbar goes forward and he says, do you know who I am? Ana Ali, Ana Ali ibn al Hussein ibn Ali. My grandfather and my father and my great-grandfather is more is more qualified to lead the ummah than you people who are immoral out there. He is preaching to them while they're attacking him. They say he fought valiantly. He killed many. He comes back. Some historians say he comes back. He goes back again. And this time, Hasin bin Namir says that I am going to kill this young boy. But the interesting thing is when he came forward, they all the enemies looked at each other. He says, that's the prophet. We are fighting the prophet. Look at him, the Prophet is in front of us. That's the beauty of his face. Hasin bin Namir was so disconnected with Allah, he takes a spear and he lunges into the chest of Ali Akbar. Ali Akbar falls from the horse. He calls his Baba, Baba, Alaikum minni salam. <laughs> and the father comes towards him and Ali Akbar breathes his last. Allah, 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 Allah,